So we've come up with a, a story about what happens when you get a binary star, which one component is a white dwarf. You get the star, which is expanding, filling its Roche lobe, spilling gas via a hotspot onto an accretion disk and onto a white dwarf. Now that is indeed a true story for about 75% of these sort of binary systems. But in this video, we're going to be talking about the other 25%, which are altogether weir weirder. It's a great pleasure to have my colleague, Dr. Lilia Ferrario from uh, Maths here at ANU, who is an expert on the other 25%. So, the other 25%, what's different about them? Well, they are different because, as you can see, what we have here is a very um, large accretion disk around this white object here, which is the white dwarf. There is accreting matter, um, and here you will have a boundary layer, and the matter is just the accretion disk is coming all the way to the surface of the white dwarf. When we have that the white dwarf is uh, magnetic, is highly magnetic, then the disk is not going to be able to reach the uh, surface of the white dwarf, but it will be disrupted by the magnetic field. So this is a picture of a magnetic field of a white dwarf. Yeah. So are white dwarfs typically magnetic? No, actually, mag magnetic white dwarfs are quite rare. Um, we talk about um, 8 to 10 percent of um, white dwarfs are highly magnetic. And when I say I'm highly magnetic, I mean with a field of about uh, um, 10 to the 6 gauss, 1 mega gauss. And, uh, Do we know what's different about those white dwarfs as opposed to the others? Well, why they are magnetic, this is a good question. There are actually quite a lot of uh, papers now in the uh, literature which try to explain exactly this point why only a subset of, magnet of uh, white dwarfs are magnetic. Because if it is something that happens during um, the evolution of a star then you would expect that well they would all end up being magnetic. So while only this is a small subset something must be happening. So there are two theories um, that uh, people um, are considering quite seriously. One is the fossil field theory, so they say, okay, stars are born from the interstellar medium and some parts of the inter interstellar mediums are more magnetic than others, so that when stars are born in these parts, of in, in the magnetic parts of the interstellar medium, then these, um, these stars become highly magnetic and they explain why there are some main sequence stars that are highly magnetic. So this theory, it would all be from how the stars are born. It's a sort exactly. Of nature yes. rather than nurture. Some yes. stars are, b are born in giant molecular clouds, have lots of magnetic fields, and they keep it all yeah. the way through their main sequence lifetime. That's and even right. when they die and turn into white dwarf, they still got right. magnetic fields. Right. And other ones don't. And other ones don't. Just so that would poor. explain it. And also would explain why um, the, um, the magnetic field flux. Um, the highest magnetic fluxes are the same in all these uh, types of objects from main sequence all the way to um, white dwarfs and the neutron stars. But I mean this theory uh, has had some problems because uh, it's not clear how a magnetic field could survive through stellar evolution, particularly in an intermediate mass, sta mass star where um, yes, the Dynamos evolution is extremely, that's sort of right, stuff. it is very complicated. So it's gone a bit out of favour. And the other possibility that people have been discussing is uh, that of uh, stellar mergers. So when you have two stars merging in a binary system, then the differential rota rotation created in the envelope of the merging object uh, creates um, these uh, very strong magnetic fields. So in that case, these mm. uh, magnetic white dwarf binaries might have been a triple That's star right. system originally, and two of them merged exactly. to produce a magnetic white dwarf, and yes. the other ones then yes. feeding gas onto that. Yes. <sighs> yes. I thought it was complicated so. enough as it was. <laughs> no, things can always be more complicated in astronomy, as you know. <laughs> as in the rest of life. Okay, so how, what difference does this make? Here's an artist's impression of a uh, magnetic of white dwarf. Of a magnetic white dwarf, yes. Uh, this is um, an intermediate polar, in fact. And, uh, well, what we can see is that the, the accretion disk does not come all the way to the surface of the star. So what we have is the formation of the two accretion curtains. They are called accretion curtains. And one accretion curtain that is hitting the white dwarf um, at the North Pole, 
And uh, then we've got this other accretion curtain, which is hitting the other um, magnetic pole. This is a bit like so, maybe the aurora of the Earth, the charged particles mm, are funneled down the magnetic yes, field lines. Yes, exactly. Only the magnetic yes. field here is much, much, much it's stronger. Much, than much Earth. stronger. Yes. If we, here in uh, the intermediate polars, we talk about the magnetic field of about. Uh, um, between, say, 1 megagauss, 10 to the 6 gauss, to about 10, 15. By comparison, um, what's the magnetic field of the Earth? Half a gauss. Yes, so about a million <laughs> times stronger than the Earth. <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> it's a very serious magnetic field, yes. Okay. So, yes, everything else is... Um, is like we yeah, so we you still have, have the, the stream right. and the hot spot and the disc the disc uh, gets horribly traumatized when it comes <laughs> close in by this magnetic field yes but otherwise everything um is it, it, when we observe this uh, these systems we still see um that there are um, lines that are formed in the disc in the hot spot but then we also see the signatures of these curtains okay. so you can see that we, we don't have a Keplerian motion anymore, but we have uh, um, the info of material onto um, the white dwarf surface. Okay. And they're very strong X-ray sources. Now, there are some of these sources of the magnetic fields are stronger still. So what happens there? Yeah, things get extremely weird at this point. So what happens is that here, we have the ballistic stream coming from, you are sitting on the Lagrangian point somewhere okay. there. Yes. So this is coming from the, the Roche overflow, <laughs> yes, falling from the other star. Right. And, and instead then, of hitting a hot spot, it hits a magnetic field. Exactly. It hits the magnetic field. So you've got the very hot region at the base where the threading of uh, uh, the material occurs. And then the material starts streaming along what is called a funnel. And then what we have here is an accretion shock. So you have uh, emission of uh, very um, hard and soft X-rays and also cyclotron emission, which we're going to talk about in a second. And this is your um, highly magnetic white dwarf. So here's a, a view from a bit further out of the yes. whole Yes, so here you can see all the various components. So again, you see your um, late type star so your um, inner Lagrangian point will be somewhere here, ballistic stream, but you can see that instead of uh, having the material forming an accretion disk, you have uh, a coupling region on the orbital plane, and then the material is lifted, it forms an accretion funnel, and it hits the white dwarf surface. Okay, so how do these things um, look different? We talked about um, cyclotron radiation. So yeah. far for this white dwarf, we talked about black body radiation, yes. optically thick and optically thin. Uh, but here we're talking about something quite different. Do you want to talk us through what cyclotron radiation is? Well, what happens is that what we have are uh, charged particles. This is an electron. And these ones are your magnetic field lines. So the white dwarf will be somewhere off, uh, um, off to the um, left. And what we have here is uh, an electron. There is a spiraling along these magnetic field lines. Yeah, presumably an electron that's moving, it's a moving charge, which is a yeah. current, and if yes. you have a current magnetic field, you get a sideways you get force. A sideways force. And so if you've got yes. a particle moving with a sideways force, it will go in circles. <laughs> so that's here it exactly goes, loop, correct. Loop and there. as it goes in circles, it emits radiation, because any charge accelerated particle emits radiation. Yeah, it's just like a radio transmitter. You, in that case, you jiggle electrons up and down a pole and they yeah. radiate, you know, TV. That's right. If in this case, you're <laughs> jiggling it round and round in circles and it generates its... It's what we, sort of we frequencies we're we talking about here? Um, well, here we talk about... Um, um, I mean, the, the emission occurs for a typical AM her would occur in the infrared. Okay. And then so what you're going to observe, yes, to terrestrial yes. radio, and then it's accelerating really fast because the magnetic field yes. is so strong. But the, there will be harmonics that will will be observed in uh, the um, optical spectrum. Okay, so the spectrum is going to look a bit different. You want to talk us through this diagram? Okay. Well, first of all, let me say that you don't see cyclotron harmonics in every spectrum of uh, a magnetic system. So th you have to have quite um, uh, special circumstances because if the accretion rate is very, very high, then uh, uh, all the harmonic features will be washed out. Just smothered as all the stuff falls in. Somehow. Yes, so you don't see anything anymore. So we are in a situation a bit like um, that of the your dwarf novi where what you really have is that 
the emission is really dominated by the accretion disk. In this mm -hmm. case, in an AM HER type system, the accretion AM the, the, the emission, is the archetype of these sort of systems. Yeah, will will be dominated by um, by the accretion funnel. So this is quite interesting. These are the very first uh, circular harmonics ever observed uh, in uh, an AM HER type system. And as you say, AM HER was the prototype, the one that was the first observed in uh, 1977. Okay. And uh, somebody just, uh, Santiago Tapia, pointed uh, a polarimeter to w observe a cataclysmic variable and this noticed it was highly. The ta um, yes. <laughs> measures the polarization. Yes. It was highly polarized. And uh, so this, these observations were made in the late uh, 70s um, on the Anglo-Australian telescope. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, the spectrum has this Wiggles. cyclotron. Humps. So that's caused, the each hump is caused by uh, the frequencies by of the electrons frequency. spiralling around. Yes. And what's the spectrum at the bottom? That's the faint. Form. Well, this is the faint side of the star. So this um, is the side where the stuff where is slamming the into it. Where the shock And that's the opposite is side. And this is the opposite side. So you can see in the opposite side, yeah, there is no, about before. Yeah, there is uh, nothing. There are no wiggles. But on the side where the accretion shock is, then we have this uh, cyclotron harmonic pattern. Yeah, we've got infrared spectrum here. And this the is an, the infrared spectrum of another AM Her type system, which is called STLMI. And uh, this, as I said, it's in the infrared, so these ones are microns on the x-axis. And again, what we can see is this wiggle, this, we can see these cyclotron humps, and uh, they can be modeled with a field strength of uh, 12 megagauss. Okay, so um, what, what do you find so fascinating about these systems? What I find fascinating, well, the, the physics is absolutely fascinating because it is something that cannot be reproduced in a terrestrial lab. I mean, this kind of magnetic fields, uh, well, th we, we can't have them, we can't create them on Earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it, it's a quite um, extreme type of uh, uh, physics that we are looking at, something that we can only observe. Mm -hmm in space. Now most astronomers tend to avoid magnetic fields wherever possible. <laughs> oh, magnetic field! Um, because they're too complicated. I mean, yeah. uh, do you find them particularly complicated? Or? Well, yes they are, because obviously they, you, d you do introduce a lot of complication, but you see, in most cases you can probably avoid having to introduce these magnetic fields. Uh, after all, as we know, some 90 odd percent of stars are non-magnetic, so why bother with putting magnetic fields in? But when you start looking at this kind of objects, then uh, you can't. You can't avoid magnetic fields. And uh, you just have to, to try to fit the observations, to understand the observations as much as you can. And uh, you have to understand the role that magnetic fields play in this kind of objects. Great. Well, thank you mm. for coming in. My pleasure.